And that's the context to most of the New Testament, if not all of it, is in the context of the end is coming soon. We're in the last days of the old age, not the end of the world. And mistranslations of certain words have put in the end of the world, and it actually means the end of the age. Uh, and therefore, you can change the meaning of something. And people have changed the meaning of generation to race. Well, it's a different word. You know, genere and gen also completely different words. But they're similar words, and translators have, have changed the words in English from one to another to explain their theology and their position that this is the end of the world and not the end of an age. A few years ago, I wonder if thought split frequencies was all to do with new new age stuff. In fact, I thought everything was new age that actually isn't. And hmm. about five years ago, the Lord started um, bringing up the subject of frequencies. I'm, I'm a, well, I was never, I'm a musician. Mm. And I felt he wanted me to look at frequencies and play in a different frequency to four four zero. It brought yeah. it was very controversial. That was about three years ago, and he had a lot of opposition to that. Nevertheless, I went with it because I really believed that this was what God wanted, and um, and he really confirmed a lot of things actually that God's been speaking uh, to mm. me about without you wonder if it if you're being deceived i would wonder because i was told i was in deception yeah uh, then obviously you don't know if you're in deception because you can't tell can you so mm -hmm. i just kept saying well lord you know you're gonna have to show me if i'm deceived but but this feels right what if it's not hey uh that's mm. all you can do really so yeah. and that I'd never heard of those singing bowls. Oh, I mean, obviously, only in a new age way. And I wondered, how did you find out about the power of frequencies? And um, is okay. it is the hurts important, or is it like the intention that that's um, put into things? Okay. About, I love those singing bowl things. Now. Yeah, it's Listening both. Them. Um, frequency in itself um, has an impact on our body and every, every area because everything's free everything's vibrating um if you think of the say love being a very high frequency if you come and engage love love can raise your frequency up and entrain that frequency to come higher and then you become in harmony with that frequency you resonate with it that produce benefits within your whole being um low frequencies the body can operate low frequency wise when it's angry unforgiveness negative emotions create low frequencies and therefore they draw low frequencies towards them and therefore you come into agreement with low frequencies and that causes potentially could cause dis-ease you know disease is just the system out of ease out of rest out of harmony so you know all that happens um in the sense of a frequency now frequency is a scientific term really is just the the rate at which something is vibrating um and if you tune a to 444 then the whole musical scale operates on a particular set of frequencies um that if you if you read into that there are some some good stuff out there online a friend of mine del hungerford has got some very good articles she's a concert um sort of musician and a, a teach professor of music she's got some very good articles on frequency and particularly how that relates to solfeggio scales and all this sort of stuff but when it comes to um changing what a is tuned to that seemed to be changed somewhat i think in the in the 20th century and previously to that it was uh different now i know uh, some christian museums musicians are changing their tuning to 432 or 444 and uh, both of them have different properties when you engage it i remember when our musicians did that i felt something yeah i i my whole being connected to the songs that we were singing in a way that i'd not done before and there seemed to be something more in tune and harmonious with God at those different frequency tunings. Now, you know, 
there's scientific things behind that and you know i'm not going to go into all that but ultimately when i first went into heaven in 2010 in in a consistent way one of the first things that god spoke to me about was frequency harmony resonance and again i did exactly the same as you oh that sounds weird looked it up found a whole load of new age stuff and it was like oh but you told me about this so there's got to be some significance in why you're speaking to me about that he also spoke to me about quantum physics and quantum entanglement and quantum tunneling and all these things and i'm like what's what is all this about but then I began to understand over a period of time that how God has created the universe, how when he spoke things into being, light, resp light responded to his voice and formed a reality. Now, we call that collapsing a wave function, making a choice which effectively orders reality. And quantum physics would say that the observer affects reality by its observation. And that's done in various experiments, the double slit experiment and other things. Now, it's weird. You know, it, it doesn't seem very scientific, but actually it's the mystical and the scientific coming together in a revelation of how God formed things and how God created things and how he wants us to operate within that creational dynamic. Um, and the more I began to explore it, the more God began to show me and show me how this worked in, you know, and how we can we can be in two places at once or multiple places at once because you know quantum entanglement that's what it does you know you 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 split uh, you know a thing into let's say three they're divided by millions of miles but they're still instantly affected when one is affected the others are affected so you know i learned that's what it is when we're in heaven our physical being and our emotional being our soul is affected you know directly instantly you know from that connection so when i began to look at frequency god started to speak to me more about it i went to a conference in seattle oh, well i was actually speaking at the conference in seattle and they had some people set up stalls and one of the stalls had these sort of crystal bowls and i didn't pay any attention to it because i again sort of wasn't really into that sort of thing um um but during the sessions um i i began to talk to the guy who was at the uh stall with all the crystal bowls and things and and other things and he he sort of started to explain a little bit about the whole thing of frequency and then it was like oh this this is this is similar to what god has been talking to me about and then they did a bowl workshop in which they put out all sorts of different bowls um for different frequencies different scales so there's some big bowls littler bowls and they encourage people to come and try them and you know i i was sort of sitting there thinking i'm not gonna bother you know uh, but then then god nudged me and said you know go and give it a go so i did and as i began to to do it i felt the vibration in my body i felt something you know in, in positive you know it was a positive thing um going on and then the guy gave me a crystal bowl you know he just gave me one as a gift and i thought well, how am i going to get this home from seattle without breaking it or whatever so i put it in my backpack managed to sort of wrap it up with towels and things and got it home and then i started to to use it and i didn't know what i was doing but i tried not to figure it out and work it out in a cognitive way I just let my spirit dictate what I was going to do. And I learned how to use the bowl, how to produce sounds, how to produce vibrational sounds, sometimes how higher sounds, lower sounds, just by using an implement on the bowl in different ways. You know, and you can have different implements that use different things to make different songs. You can have just the dong of the sound, but you can also make the sound go deeper and deeper as it resonates within you and then i started to ask god about it and he said i want you to get a set of bowls so i got a set of uh seven bowls all tuned um i think they were tuned to four three two and 
they were all different colors, the seven colors of the rainbow. And I, and I ordered these things online. Um, and again, I said to God, well, what am I going to do it? What am I going to do with them? How am I going to use them? And he said, first, I want you to cleanse them. I thought, OK, because, you know, you, you don't know what's happened to them, what what is stored within the fabric of the bowl, what intention is already in the bowl. So he showed me how to cleanse them. Uh, I cleansed them and started using them. And I, I and I just went with sort of how God showed me to use them. And some of the frequencies are known to have certain effects, like 528 is a healing frequency. I think 704, I think, is a resurrection or re re restoration frequency. Different things where uh, that the frequency itself can have a physical effect on the body in a positive way. But intention is more powerful in the when you have an intention, that intention can travel to someone else on that frequency now that happens when we speak if i speak literally there is a wave of air that people's ears pick up and they translate that in their brain as sound and language so i can speak and they'll understand me and that can have an effect on them in a very normal everyday way but what i speak intentionally can have a different effect if I said something negative to them, you're ugly and horrible and everyone hates you, then that is going to negatively affect them. If I said something positive, God loves you, you're the apple of his eye, you're the treasure of his heart, you are unconditionally loved and blessed to be a blessing, that will enhance what they feel and sense. So even our words as frequencies, because that's literally what they are, waves, basically can have a positive and a negative effect and scientists who did some studies on this actually showed that that can have an effect in water when you speak to water or you play different sorts of sounds and frequencies when you then crystallize the water it freezes in patterns which are harmonious and beautiful like sort of snowflake patterns or sort of just horrible looking things you know it's really not good um, and then the Dr. Emoto is, it's, I think, a Japanese guy who basically then started to study this. And he he boiled some rice and split it into two jars. On one jar, he wrote uh, the word hate. On the other jar, he wrote the word love. And, you know, and I whether his intention, that was his intention. I don't know whether he spoke words of hate and love, probably did. And then after a few days, the one with hate was actually starting to go off and started to form mold or whatever it was and went off um, where the other one was perfectly good and carried on for a long time. So th there was this indication that, OK, having this positive sort of intention can have a positive effect. And then he did an experiment on a lake which was polluted and he got a group of people to fix their thoughts and intentions on purity in the water and the water actually cleared and became pure and there's a another lady called lynn mctaggart who does something around intention the intention experiment thing and she uses people's intentions focus to help find people who are lost or missing positive things using intention to open things up so you know these things have have grown in understanding and we use them so when i had the bowls i initially asked if anyone was interested to do a sort of a little bit of an experiment workshop to see whether we could use them and whether these things worked so about 10 people did we sort of came i showed them how to use the bowls how to actually play them and then i said okay here's number one experiment i am going to play the bowl with an intention and a thought, which is an emotion that I want you to feel, but I'm not going to tell you what it is. So I released the emotion and then I said, OK, I want you to tell me what you felt. And one person said they felt peace. Another said they felt rest. Another person said they felt calm. Um, and actually, I released peace. 
that was what my intention was. And people felt it. They described it in different ways, but they felt that piece. And then each of us had a go and the others would see what they felt. And there were some people who were really in tune with it and picked up every intention. And then I then took that into a larger gathering and I said, look, I want to release a healing intention into the room using these. And I had three bowls, three large 12 inch bowls, which I think were C, uh, D and E, I think. Um, and I started playing them with the intention. And I just said to people, be open to receive the intention that I'm releasing into your body. And then when I did that, I asked for, was there anyone who felt anything? Did anyone? And one guy who, um, you know, wasn't really um, from sort of the church background, but was in our rehabilitation unit. He said that his the whole side of his body was numb, uh, which he had caused through drug use. And that while he felt this frequency go into his body and he felt his body started to vibrate, the whole numbness went from the whole side of his body and it returned to normal. So again, that was a, a an experiment we did to show that. Now, we know Jesus spoke and people were healed. We know Jesus laid hands on people, which can create a vibrational energy. People were healed. We know Jesus spoke and someone was healed who wasn't even present. So there was an intention which was able to transverse physical location. Um, and there's lots of instances where, like Paul, Paul laid hands on hankies or um, aprons and things, cloth material. He must have imparted something that we would normally call anointing, which is a vibrational energy, you know, and then those pieces of cloth were put on people and those people were healed now christians who aren't who would call this stuff new age would say that the bible says that but as soon as you start talking about how that might have happened they're like oh no 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 they just think it's magic and i think that's the problem christians who aren't really tuned in they just think well god just heals it just happens and they're quite happy to believe it just happens like magic. But as soon as you start to try and explain the science behind what might, they think, oh, well, that, that's not faith, you know? And it's like, well, you shouldn't be trying to work out how it happens. Well, God showed us how it happens, you know? And literally he showed me how to generate anointing because we were dependent on, well, the Holy Spirit giving us a gift of healing. And then we might lay hands on people. People might feel heat in our hands, vibrational energy, sort of little tang tinglings, or they might be totally overwhelmed by the power that was coming and they would fall on the floor. Now, so there was something physical, tangible that was happening while we were laying on our hands. Well, how? Well, then God said to me, I want you to focus what I said you can do, like lay hands on the sick and see them recover, focus that intention and then release that intention through your hand by channeling the energy that's coming from the spirit in us. Rivers of living water flowing from our innermost being. Channel it. Now, as soon as you then start to use the word channeling, the, oh, you can't use words like that. Well, it's only saying that something is coming from inside me, out of me, touching you. Well, that's what people do when they lay hands on people. They're channeling some sort of energy, but they don't like the words. And that's the problem. They don't like using the words, so they are put off with the concepts. Um, and then they reject everything around that area. So God showed me that by my intention, focusing what God said, my belief in what he said, and my agreement with what he said could channel that energy through my hand into someone's body. And in the past, people like William Branham, who was one of the healing revivalists of the 1940s, 50s, um, he would touch people's hands and feel the vibrational energy in their body and name the disease that they were suffering with without being told. 
So he learned. Now, he said that an angel told him how to do that. So, you know, that's it. And there's a famous picture of him in a meeting with a big halo around his head, which was taken, you know, in the days when you couldn't doctor images with Photoshop or something. So people couldn't explain why there was this glow around him. Um, and But again, he was tuning into something that God used to show him how to ministrate healing. Now, I'm not saying everyone has to do that. People can do whatever they feel God's leading them to do. But ultimately, we can then tune into frequencies. So you can use crystal bowls as a sound bath. So you surround people with the bowls and you play the bowls and the sound of the bowls is all around them and it immerses them in a frequency which you can release intention into. You can also put the bowls on you so that they're on your chest or on your hand. And when you play them, you can feel it. You, know, you can actually feel the energy and resonate with that energy. And literally, there was one big bowl, which probably was about, I don't know, two foot six across, that you could stand in. And then when they played it, that your whole body vibrated. I mean, it was like really powerful. And I, I had a sand bath think i was where was i i was in uh arizona i think i was um in uh phoenix and i had a sand bath and this guy put these bowls some of the some were the crystal bowls some of them were the tibetan singing bowls the metal ones he put them on my body down my back and onto my legs and as soon as he started playing them i went into a deep deep encounter with god instantly it was like bang you know and i was aware of all sorts of things going on but at a at a really deep level and god spoke to me and then i shared and i said what did you feel and see and he, he shared some things and i and i was like yeah that's what i saw and feel and felt you know and it was interesting um and it was very positive there was nothing negative about it the guy doing it is is a you know christian he, he's doing this to help people you know he gives people sand baths he uses them in ministry to help set people free to bring healing to people often when people are feeling oppressed or depressed it can really help to bring a, a peace around them and submerge them and cocoon them in a sound of peace and an intention of peace and that can really help them you know so there's a lot of things around frequency which um is i believe god is revealing our intention now the same thing would apply to fragrant oils or essential oils they carry a frequency which is a high level of frequency within the purity of the oil and then when you place that onto a person or they smell it and breathe in the the, the fragrance that can begin to operate in their lives can release healing it can release toxic emotions in them can do all sorts of things so more and more people are beginning to discover so these are just things that God has created within the fabric of creation. And we're just tapping into how the power of words works. Well, we know the Bible says that Jesus holds things, all things together by the voice of his power. Well, what does that mean? Well, we don't really know. or well, people don't really know. They just think, oh, well, it's God's voice. He holds all things together because he says something. Well, that might be true. But actually, thoughts are words. You can have words in your mind as thoughts. You can have intentions that are attached to words in your mind. So it's focusing them that's the key. And literally, when you play a bowl, your intention can travel to touch someone else in the room or across the airwaves, because I've done it online, and you could hear me playing a bowl, and that bowl could have a positive effect on you at a distance. Because there's no distance in the spirit, in a sense. And there's also no distance over the airwaves when we're on the internet, if you like. There's Wi-Fi, you know, that which is a frequency. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and you can have different frequencies of how Wi-Fi works, you know. Um, and therefore, it's, they're all in the same sort of framework. And we don't have a problem 
in the scientific thing, well, Wi-Fi works. You know, we, our our gadgets are able to pick up the frequency, which is the connection to the router that then is connected via our phone line or whatever to a server somewhere and all of this stuff works by sort of magic you know i mean most people don't know how it works but those who have some scientific background understand that there's a you know http sort of or hdvs sort of protocols which break down code into particular communication packets and that's sent across the you know like this is very basic you know i'm not a, I'm not a scientist in that field but it's very basic but that's literally what happens and literally you are breaking something down into zeros and ones and something decodes those zeros and ones at the other end simply put you know and we we the world operates on that mm. why wouldn't you know people are just discovering they've not they've not invented these things they're discovering that these things exist they're just yeah. using that discovery in a particular way but we can also use that ourselves and intention really is the key you focus your intention and desire and that intention begins to create that reality reality around you and it collapses into what we then call history the past my uh, there's every possibility right now for me to do or say whatever at this moment and as soon as i choose one that is the reality that we're all participating in because you're seeing what i'm doing and hearing what i'm doing and you're then feeling what i'm doing and you're experiencing what i'm doing i could have done something else and that would have changed your reality we can choose to live creating our future realities out of God's desire for us and choosing to come into agreement with his future for us to bring about that future. Or we can be in agreement with our past and what has always happened to us. So we just keep replicating what's always happened to us in different ways. But it just means we carry on with the status quo or we can choose something different. And our intention focused can engage let's say the quantum field the unified quantum field and form and collapse realities now it takes me i can do that around my life you can do it around your life we can do it as a group because we're engaged together you can't just choose a reality to change the world because there's seven billion people all choosing realities every second every microsecond so you would need an agreement of a larger group of people to change a reality, which is what they did with the thought intention and the lake with Dr. Emoto or the Lynn McTaggart's intentional stuff. There was a choice to do that together in agreement and there's power in agreement and you have exponential increase in agreement. So you don't necessarily need seven billion people all agreeing. But you need enough people to exponentially over overwhelm the negative frequencies of all the other people who are choosing other things. If you're going to change things on a big scale. But when we're in agreement with the mind of Christ, his thought frequencies, we come into agreement and we resonate with those thought th frequencies. Then what we speak carries the weight of his voice. And light responds to his voice and when it's a corporate voice in agreement you can see powerful things take place you know but sometimes it takes time for those powerful things to outwork they're not always instant because uh, it takes time sometimes for intention to be outworked into reality so interesting subject there's a lot around it um uh, but God is unveiling and revealing more and more around those things. You know, when I go back to 2010, I really had no idea when God said, you know, I want you to, you know, understand frequency, harmony, resonance, you know, these type of things. It was like, Whoa, what's all that about? You know, but I just kept walking it out until the revelation came in a deeper and deeper way. And then I began to experience it and use it and everything else, you know and yeah. Yeah, it's, it's you know it's everyday life for most people 
um, in a scientific sense. They just operate out of the technology that's around them. But when it comes to us choosing a reality and being the observer of that reality in such a way that it forms, most people don't know how to do that. So they keep getting what they've always got. You know, therefore, you've got to change your thinking to create a different future from your past in alignment with what God's desire is. Now, you get people you know, who are not Christians, but are operating in this field. And there are people like Joe Dispensenza and other people like that who are teaching people how to choose different realities. And they're finding that healing comes and positive things and changes take place in their lives. So it's a principle in creation, but it works, I feel, much better when you can connect to the creator and use his intention and his desire and his purpose for an agreement to bring it about rather than just, well, this is what I want. Now, sometimes we can choose good things and someone who's choosing healing and helping someone find healing, that's good and positive, but it doesn't always bring glory to God. And that's where, you know, we, we need to, I believe, find things that will help us in, in a connection to God outwork these things. Now, I'm not saying that the principles that these people use aren't godly principles. I think they are. And some people deliberately choose not to use the name of God because that would put a lot of people off from engaging with them because they would have a negative perspective towards religion. So, you know, so they're they're sort of using other terminology for that source. But a lot of them believe in a a universal consciousness or god in another in using another term but they just don't use the term god usually in those settings but some are and some people are using the fact that god created and wants us to use these things you know in everyday life you know to live out his purpose in, in the way we live and help other people too as well you know so there we go yeah, and there's a lot of fear, isn't there, that, that needs yeah. just just the light bringing truth. It's actually God who's made these things. And yeah. it's just that people, anyone yeah. can use it, and people who aren't um, in Christ yeah. are using it. And people who, yeah. are, who are believers are put off it because of that, which is... Yeah, just, um, well, religion will always use fear to keep people from mm -hmm. something it doesn't understand or doesn't line up with its doctrinal belief systems. Oh, yeah. I don't think it's any, in any way inconsistent with the truth of who God is and Jesus being the truth and what the Bible says yeah. generally. Yeah, it's just that the sort of fear comes because they don't understand it and it's associated with those that are not Christians, you know, quote, um, and therefore, well, that must be all wrong then. Yeah. You know? Uh, and that that does create a problem and we need to not be fear god's not the author of fear perfect no. love has that fear so why would we need to be afraid of something scientific i mean right throughout history christians and sort of the religious institution let's say have opposed all sorts of uh changes in our understanding and technology and they've been against everything they were against the printing press you know they burnt wickliffe at the stake for printing the bible I mean, how how nonsense is that? But they did, you know, because they've opposed technology. Because why? Because that means that their power base would be removed. Suddenly, only the Bible got translated by scribes who translated it, you know, usually from into Latin and copied it into things. So the common person didn't have it. And then all of a sudden, ah, well, if the person themselves can read the Bible, then they won't need us to tell them what the Bible says. Then we're out of a job or we've lost our power or influence over them. And that was what it was all about. Power, not just fear, you know, and they've opposed technology all around. You know, I mean, they tried to put the person, burn them at the stake, I think, for saying that this, this earth revolved around the sun. You know, it's like, well now we would turn around and, well how weird is that but they were caught up you know in very small thinking 
unfortunately. Anyway, there we go. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Okay, let's go back to you, Jason. Now you've unfrozen. You can, if you want to ask your yeah, question. But, uh, yeah, from Hebrews 10, 26 and 27, where it says, For if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice of sin, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fire indignation which will devour the atmosphere. Yeah. So, and then it talks about what will the punishment be for those who have trampled on the blood of Jesus. So, yeah. yeah my question is, how does that fit with the restoration of all things and other other things that I, I think we need to believe? And I feel like this one passage really contradicts a lot of what the rest of the Bible says. Uh, so, I was wondering what you thought about this. Okay. Well, Hebrews is was written to the Hebrews. So it's an indication there of their mindsets and belief systems that, that the writer was trying to help them understand that the old covenant was ended and they were into a new covenant. Um, and he, he so that was often the context in which it was written. And when you sort of read things like that, you, you're reading them with a predisposed way of looking at it. So an evangelical will read that. If we go on sinning willfully after receiving the knowledge of truth, there is no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. Well, of course that doesn't, because there's only one sacrifice for sins and it's already happened. So if you carry on, you can't do anything different than is already done. You're already forgiven. So actually, you're not going to sacrifice an animal because, well, Jesus didn't work because someone carried on doing something independently. So you know then it says the terrifying expectation of judgment and the fury of fire which will consume the adversaries okay well what are the adversaries not people they're the things that get you to carry on operating in lost identity which causes you to operate in that way in the first place so what is a judgment it's a verdict so god passes a verdict on what you're doing and says that's not good now fire God is a consuming fire. God consumes everything in opposition to the truth so that you don't have to live that way. But then you go on. Anyone who's ignored the law of Moses is put to death without mercy. The testament of two or three witnesses. How much severe is the point? He's talking to Jewish people and trying to help them understand under their system. Here's how things worked. And just because it says that to that group of people trying to help them fathom it out is not a universal thing that we need to necessarily apply to us today. And that's part of the problem. We're not looking at audience relevance when it was written, who it was written to, why it was written. And this was all before the end of the temple system. Um, therefore, this was a covenantal thing. So literally saying Jesus has come. You who are following Judaism are trampling underfoot the son of God, not accepting him as the Messiah. Therefore, your system is going to come to an end. And we're trying to uh, interpret these things through our understanding in modern Western thought that this is Christian theology rather than who was he writing to? Why was he writing and how was he trying to explain to them? Of course, it's a terrifying thing to fall in the hands of the living God. Well, what it, for who is it terrifying? For those who are living according to the old covenant, because they have no grace operating on their life if they're choosing to operate by law. So you've got to take the whole thing of what it's saying, not just pick out one verse and trying to explain a verse without the context of the whole argument and the whole book. Because the whole book is a letter written to the Hebrews who were caught up in this controversy of do we need to keep following the law of Moses? You had the Jews, uh, Judaizers who were saying they were Christians, but they were trying to get people back under the law. They were even trying to get the Gentiles back under the law. So you, you got the whole consequence of these things going on. And of course, you know, the writer basically says things like, you know, the, the law is obsolete you know, and, and faded away so and then under the old you couldn't touch any of these things but now 
you can touch these things hebrews 12 you know you couldn't touch mount zion because they didn't touch mount zion because they were afraid to come to god and they sent moses so they set up a mediation system so now god is saying in this the writer is basically saying hey you don't need a mediation system anymore this is open and again he says that you know that now you can come into the holy of holies which was only for the priest because now we're all priests and kings you know under the order of melchizedek so he was sort of trying to help understand the transition from the old into the new and it isn't talking about judgment of someone at the end of the world and all that thing it's an it's a judgment on the system and the people who are following the system who go on sinning willfully so they go on think, forget the behavior and think of it as lost identity attached to a belief system which is keeping them following a religious system which is ended and doesn't work so god's judgment on that is this does not work and my fire is going to consume all of this system which is in opposition to the true grace-based salvation that's found in jesus this system will never save anybody therefore the adversaries are those who are the or the system itself is the adversary let's say but jesus warned those who stayed in the system and stayed in Jerusalem, what would happen to them at the end of that age in that Jerusalem would be destroyed, the temple would be destroyed, the heavens and the earth would be destroyed, which was the name for the temple where heaven met earth. And that's the context to these things. And that's the context to most of the New Testament, if not all of it, is in the context of the end is coming soon. We're in the last days of the old age not the end of the world and mistranslations of certain words have put in the end of the world and it actually means the end of the age uh, and therefore you can change the meaning of something and people have changed the meaning of generation to race well it's a different word you know genia and genos are completely different words but they're similar words and translators have, have changed the words in English from one to another to explain their theology and their position that this is the end of the world and not the end of an age. So that's really where these things come in. And there is no sacrifice for sins other than Jesus. You know, he is the one and true sacrifice once and for all time, which is what it says in Hebrews. And, and he was trying to help them. The writer was trying to help them understand the power of the crucifixion and the resurrection and the new covenant that we're in. But using terminology that they understood, referring to their system of belief, and we read it today and Christians are trying to understand it through Christian theology and coming up with the wrong conclusion completely. You know, um, and that's that's part of the problem. And they're using Old Testament scriptures, which is does here. Vengeance is mine. I will repay. You know, the Lord will judge his people. Well, he did judge the old covenant system. And that old covenant system came to an end and the new covenant was. But it didn't die. It was rebirthed, if you like. The new covenant came out of the end of the old covenant. And in Matthew 24, that's what Jesus said would happen. These are the birth pangs of the new. Not the old, you know, birth pangs are not something dying. Birth pangs are something being born. So what was the end of the old, which was a destruction of the old, actually revealed the new and were the birth pangs of the new um you know and you know unfortunately if you read it on face value with a conditioning from evangelicalism you'll get the wrong conclusion of what it's saying without looking at the whole premise of the book you know same things goes to other things where it talks about striving to enter rest that's what they were doing striving through a religious system to enter into a rest which was never going to be possible for them 
in a man-made system of beliefs and works and sacrifices and offerings, it never worked. But we read that, or we must strive to enter rest, thinking it's talking to us. Well, we're already in rest. We rest in the finished work of Jesus and we're included in him. We don't have to strive to enter anything. We're already included in anything. But you read those verses. Well, the Bible says it. But that's not the context of which it says it. And that is the problem. We've been conditioned into thinking sola scriptura, every verse and every letter of every word, we need to actually apply today to our lives. And that can cause huge problems with people, unfortunately. Yeah. 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 It, it's very hard yeah. you know, in these things to sort of get free of these mindsets of judgment and wrath and anger. But God is a loving God and but he is a consuming fire, but he doesn't consume people. He consumes the things that hold people in bondage. That's what he wants to do. That's why the old covenant ended in fire. We talked about frequencies, and uh, I have been listening to quite a lot of videos uh, on the on YouTube. Um, and the origin is really Buddhist, Buddhist, uh, some Buddhist person who, and there is a picture of Buddha on it. And mm. but the music is so beautiful. I mean, mm. it's this Indian flute, you know, mm. and other like. Uh, instruments from that time old instruments and yeah. the bows that they have and i haven't felt anything evil or anything mm. bad I, i've been careful thinking you know intention what is intention but it is according to what it says on the internet it is for healing for sleep for calmness you know all that so they but of course it's on the internet can you really I mean, well, I think it's, this comes down again to your intention. See, Buddhism mm -hmm. is a philosophy of life more than a religion. Because essentially, they're not really worshipping Buddha. They know Buddha mm -hmm. died. It's a, no. it's a teaching philosophy, which actually contains very much similar teaching to Jesus. Love mm -hmm. one another. You know, the golden rule, treat people the way you want to be treated. You know, I've. I, was in in cambodia vietnam thailand in march and i found it very interesting looking at the buddhist temples and the philosophy and and looking at how they did things and why they did things and it was like okay you know and not in a negative way i didn't go over there i wanted i was just interested to see well what was this really about now obviously jesus is not at the center of it you know, but that doesn't mean that there isn't truth contained within it. Yeah. And in terms of meditation and how you focus, how you come to a place of rest, you know, using music and using certain things and frequencies can be helpful. Mm -hmm. But what we're not doing is applying Buddhist philosophy. As a Buddhist, we're seeing mm -hmm. truth is truth and we're applying the truth as it comes from Jesus through yeah. jesus not yeah. through a buddhist principle or anything else and that is the difference and i know people will say ah oh, yeah but if you if you touch that the root of it is evil therefore you can't and the end of the day well who said that the root of something is evil why why wouldn't jesus as the truth deposit truth in all sorts of places for people to discover to ultimately help them discover him mm -hmm. You know, and there is the story of a of a God who was crucified with a crown of thorns in the H Hindu religion. Well, where did that come from? Well, I believe Jesus deposited it in there that then when they heard the story of the crucifixion, they may be drawn towards Jesus. You know, but we we, in a sense, are engaging with Jesus, the truth not through the philosophy that is being presented. And if certain music is helpful to you, you you are essentially cleansing the music by using it with your intention for your good. The same thing would be, you know, back in the day, they were told not to eat meat sacrificed to idols. You know, well, why? 
Well, because they were afraid of being polluted by meat sacrifice to idols. And Paul was saying, well, the idols are nothing. They're just stone and wood. Well, what was behind it may be some demonic thing. But when you ate the meat, you were not worshipping the demonic thing. You were just eating a piece of meat. Just because it had been sacrificed to an idol doesn't mean there was any power in it to harm you. And Paul was trying to help them see, you know, that it had no power, only what you gave it. So if you thought that this was a negative thing and you shouldn't do it, then don't do it. Because you are then going against your own conscience and that could be a negative thing. But actually, there is nothing negative actually about the piece of meat. So why not eat it? And that was what Paul was trying to get over to them. Don't be in bondage to these things. You know, if you don't want to eat it, don't eat it. But if you do want to eat it, eat it. It's not going to have any negative effect on you because it's just a piece of meat. You know, that was really what Paul was trying to get over to them. And the same would apply to these type of things when it comes to using frequencies and bowls and music and intention. You know, but there is also a lot of good Christian stuff out there as well that also carries a good positive intention with sound and, and music, which has a embedded frequency in it. So for me, would I listen to Buddhist music when there's stuff I know I can engage in? Probably not. I wouldn't need to. Do I actually listen to music that way at all? Not not really. Um, but I do know, you know, Samuel, who's, who's part of our ministry, writes and composes a lot of music which has a positive intention built in for our activations and for those things. And I know that they are all very positive with a positive intention. So if anyone's got any doubt, use something which you know is coming from a good source. If you're, if you're concerned about it, but I don't necessarily believe you need to be concerned about it. You could say that the writer of the music placed something in the music to deceive you. You know, that, and, and the, the writer could, but that doesn't mean that you have to be deceived by it because you carry a higher truth. So you can cleanse a piece of music if you want to, so that its embedded goal is not going to affect you negatively because you choose something different. And I would say for a lot of people, don't listen to that stuff because you're not in a place to know how to handle that stuff. So don't listen to it. Don't bother. Find some Christian stuff to listen to that, you know, has got some good intentions, you know. But for those who are mature enough to be able to know how to handle something and not be affected by it. So it's not going to affect you like the meat sacrificed to idols was not going to be affecting mature people. But Paul said, if you're not, if you're weak and you you feel that this is going to affect you, well, don't eat it. Because you will empower it to affect you negatively by your belief. So what you believe in it is the key. Um, so I would not be, you know, too bothered by some of the philosophy behind some of it. Would I buy into the whole, because no, Buddhist philosophy, no, because it believes in reincarnation. And I don't believe we are reincarnated, that we come back into another body and have another life, to, to have another go at it. I believe we get one life, and therefore, we should make the most of that one life. And then that life continues after death um, if you were to die. And I don't believe you have to die. So in a sense, you know, we just need to take a view which which comes through Jesus, the truth. And uses Jesus as the truth to validate and give us insight into anything. Does it carry the right frequency? That's always how I'm going to check. Does it have a frequency of love on it? If it does, I know that that God is love and therefore that's going to be aligned to him. Whatever the source, because I know the frequency of love that is God. And if something is in resonance with God, I don't have a problem with it, no matter where it's come from. You know, because truth is truth. Love is love pure i mean real love i'm not talking about erotic love or things that we would do in a in a humanistic way but true agape god love is what we can measure whether things are good or not or against 
And if something doesn't have a decent frequency or good frequency, don't listen to it. You know, and but check it, check it out. And the more you know genuinely good frequency, the easier it is to discern that which isn't. I mean, sometimes I listen to some things. People send me things to listen to on YouTube and I start listening to it. Within 20 seconds, I'm like turning it off because it carries with it a completely wrong frequency and I'm just not going to listen to it. Don't I don't need to listen to it. If it's going to be negative, why would I want to be listening to something negative? So I, you need to discern. Now, we need to train our senses to discern what is good and evil. And ultimately, that it comes through the spirit. The Holy Spirit will help us to discern with discernment. But we can train our senses to discern what carries a good or negative frequency. And then we reject the negative frequencies. And accept the positive ones. But you see, I can chew the grapes and spit out the pips. So I can receive something from a source, which may not be Christian, but that doesn't mean that some of what they're saying isn't true. I mean, some of the scientific stuff on quantum physics and other things that I've listened to or watched or read, they're not mm. Christian, but they're, they're it's the truth. You know, therefore, I don't really care what they believe as a philosophy. Is it what they're saying true or not? I can accept what they're saying, which is true, and reject what they're saying, which isn't true. That's what maturity is able to do. You know, therefore, let's become mature and mm -hmm. then we can embrace the truth that we find embedded. Remember, God is in everything. Everything exists in God. In him, we live and move and have our existence. So nothing is separated from God. But we do need to learn to discern those things which are going to be helpful to us and those things which won't. And some things may be helpful to one person and won't be helpful to another, which is why I always encourage people to take things back to God themselves and ask him whether they should engage in a particular activity or listen to a particular thing. Ask him whether it's OK for them to do so. You know, don't just assume and don't just think, well, Mike said it's OK for him. That doesn't mean it's OK for you because God may have a different thing for you or for anyone else. Check it out. Always make sure that you're in alignment with the father's heart in everything you do. Then you're not going to be outside of that. You know, whatever other people might say, because some people would be very negative and very critical. Oh, that's all new age. It's all the occult. It's all dangerous. You shouldn't have anything to do with any of it. Well, you know, I'm not going to listen to people like that. I'm going to listen to what God says. And if God says to me, no, I don't want you to do anything with that. Don't have anything to do with that. And to be honest, I don't listen to a lot of anything which is outside of God. In fact, I don't listen to much at all other than God. You know, I want to get my truth from God, you know. Um, therefore, you know, I'm not going to listen to some new age guru, whatever. Even if they do have some personal good stuff, they may do. You know, I don't listen to certain people. Other people do. Not because I don't feel comfortable with it. I don't need to. So I don't. You know, I can generate my own frequencies of health and healing and wholeness in agreement with God. I don't really need to understand how to engage the quantum field in a way which isn't how God has taught me how to do it. So I stick with what God's taught me to do. And I stay close to him in what i'm doing now i'm not saying that some of my friends do listen to some of these people and they use that information and they're operating out of that information great i'm sure that's because god has given them permission to do so i just don't feel the need to uh, for most of it now sometimes i people ask me questions and i'm like well okay i'm i have no idea what that person teaches so i might go and find out a little bit about what they teach to give someone some insight into it. But generally, if I'm unsure and I am and I really don't want to go listening to someone and spending the time to do it, I'll just say the same thing. Go back to God and ask God for yourself. Because it's what God says to you that's important, not what God says to me. You know, and that is always the most important thing. Use Jesus as the truth, the spirit of truth. 
dwells in us to help us discern and understand what is true and what isn't. And if we stick with that, then we will learn to be more discerning and more mature about things and not be afraid of things just because they have maybe a dubious source. You know, and if someone says something, you know, there are Christians that I would wholeheartedly endorse some of the things they say, and I would totally disagree with other things they say. Does that mean I reject everything they say? No, I just accept the things which I know are in alignment with what God has said to me, and I reject the things that aren't. And then maybe later in the future, I might accept some of the things I've rejected in the past because God has then revealed something progressively to me. And that's happened loads and loads of times in my life where I would have sort of stayed away from something because I wasn't in a position at that point in time to engage with that. And then later on, I've had the revelation that God has spoken to me about something and I realize, ah, there was truth in that after all. I just couldn't see it at the time because I wasn't framing it from my experience. So I would say always err on the side of what god says to you and then you're not going to go far wrong with any in listening or watching any of these things that exist out there you know um because we do need to be discerning mm. you know and we can put people off by criticizing them in a way that is very religious and condemning and then we're, we're not going to reach people if we're condemning everything they believe if I, when I was talking to Buddhists, I was talking to them on the basis of our shared beliefs. So I wasn't saying, oh, you're all wrong about you. I didn't talk about reincarnation, but I did talk about love. And I did talk about God being love and that we can experience love and we can treat each other with love and love one another as we've been loved. And then I would say to them, have you been loved? Or is love a concept to you? Do you actually know unconditional love? Because most of them don't. They're trying to earn things by their performance. Mm. So they're trying to be good and love people, but they're doing it based on fulfilling an obligation to a teaching. It doesn't make the principle wrong, but their motive for doing it may be wrong. So I want to introduce them to, hey, this is all free and by grace. And, and, and love is a person, not a concept. You know, so you but you're not going to do that if you diss them on everything. Which is what a lot of Christians do. They're very negative about everything and then they wonder why people don't listen to them. Or have any opportunity of having a relationship with people because we well, can't have any relationship with them because they're the new age and in the occult. Well, how are we going to reach people if we can't relate to them? You know, in that way. If you enjoy these videos, would you please take a moment to like, comment and subscribe? It really does help. Thank you very much.